1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 1. One day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah in the pomegranate cave at Migran. The people who were with him were about 600 men, including Ahijah, the son of Haitub, Ichabod's brother, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priest of the Lord in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Within the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on the one side and a rocky crag on the other side. The name of the one was Bozes, and the name of the other was Sena. The one Craig rose on the north in front of Michmash, and on the other on the south in front of Geba. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison on these of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart, do as you wish. Behold, I am with your heart, with you heart and soul. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place, and we will not go up to them. But if they say, Come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into our hand. And this shall be the sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistine, and the Philistine said, Look, Hebrews are coming out of the hole, oh, out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. And the men of the garrisons hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet, and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer killed them after him. At that first strike, which Jonathan, his armor bearer, made, killed about 20 men within it, within as it, were, uh, as it were half a furrow's length in an acre of land. And there was a panic in the camp, in the field, and among the people. The garrison and even the raiders trembled, and the earth quaked, and it became a very great panic. And the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude were dispersing here and there. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, Count and see who has gone from us. And when they had counted, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. So Saul said to Ahijah, bring the ark of God here. For the ark of God went at that time uh, with the people of Israel. Now while Saul was talking to the priest, the tumult in the camp of Philistines increased more and more. And so Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him railed and went into the battle. And behold, every Philistine sword was against his fellow, and there was a great confusion. Now the Hebrews, who had been with the Philistines before that time, who had gone up with them into the camp, even they also turned to be with the Israelites, who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, when all the men of Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they too followed hard after them in the battle. Verse 23, so the Lord, so the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed beyond Beth Avon. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. You guys can be seated. Joel, join me in prayer one more time. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that in this new year, we are able to start off by meditating on the living word. Lord, we confess that so often we are enamored and we are bombarded by so much data from this world that really doesn't give life at all. In fact, it sucks life out of us. But we thank you that we can sit under your word that is life-giving, that is life-filling, that is life-transforming. We ask and pray that you would do just that to each and every one of us this morning. We thank you, Lord, for our church. We thank you for your word. Be with us this morning. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you guys are taking notes, title of today's message is Great Faith in a Great God. Great Faith in a Great God. Friends. How much influence do you think one man can have upon people? How much influence do you think one man or one woman can have upon a group of people? I think about social media. And there are actually professions nowadays, right? Job titles called influencers. Influencers that companies pay big money to advertise their product on their social media page because they have such a large following. 
Some I heard uh, charge up to a million dollars per post. I do believe that one person can single-handedly influence a group of many, both positively or negatively. Friends, influence is powerful. But with great power comes great responsibility. We saw just a chapter ago in chapter 13 of 1 Samuel how King Saul and his influence, how his selfish actions did not end very well, not only for him, but also for the entire nation of Israel. If you recall, King Saul was clearly instructed from God to wait until Prophet Samuel showed up so that Samuel can offer up the burnt offering and peace offering on behalf of God. Because back in the day, Israelites always believed that the battle belonged to God. That God, who is sovereign, who is always in control, was in control of the outcome of the battle. However, as the situation or circumstances appeared to get only worse, King Saul decided to take matters into his own hands. And he decided to offer up the sacrifices himself. He waited, he waited, and Samuel didn't show up. So he said, okay, after seven days, it's my turn. I have to do it. I've seen it before, so why not? But because of this, Saul was told from Samuel that his kingship will be taken from him, as well as from his family lineage. All of this because Saul did not do the very thing that God had desired for him. It's like the once popular meme says, you literally had one job. Saul literally had one job. That was to obey the commands of the Lord. To serve God as his king. To fully submit under the authority of God. Instead, King Saul failed because he only wanted to obey the words he wanted to obey. As the new king of Israel, he wanted to exercise his authority to pick and choose what he should obey, even when it came to God's very words and commands. Rather than fully submitting under God's authority, he wanted to be the utmost authority, not only of his own life, but also for the entire nation of Israel. I'm the king. I call the shots. You guys follow. God, I'll pick and choose what I decide to obey and not obey. And due to one man's disobedience, due to one man's unwillingness to do what he was commanded to do from God, Israel will now suffer. And his family will suffer. The royal kingship is stripped from his lineage and will now be handed off to someone else in just a short while. If you think about it, as I mentioned earlier, kingship is hereditary. So the next person who was supposed to be king is Jonathan, the son of Saul. But because of Saul's disobedience, who is the next king of Israel? We will see in the next few chapters. It was King David. While the author of this book guides us to focus on the failure of King Saul and his disobedience, we are now directed to focus upon a different character in chapter 14, who is completely different from King Saul. The character who is so closely related with King Saul and his very own son, Jonathan. If Saul hadn't messed up, Jonathan would have been the next king of Israel. But because of Saul's disobedience, Jonathan will never get his chance to be king. However, that did not stop Jonathan from displaying great faith in God and only God. And due to Jonathan's courageous faith in today's passage, because of Jonathan's faith in God, the Israelites are ultimately led to victory against the Philistines. So we have to ask this question, how was Jonathan so different from his dad? How was Jonathan so different from King Saul? What he did do, what did he do that Saul didn't do? Well, let's find out. As I mentioned just before today's passage, in chapter 13, the Israelites were lining up for battle against the Philistines. And from the look of things, things weren't looking very good for the Israelites. While the Philistines came out with guns blazing, with 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horse, 6, horsemen, and soldiers as numerous as the sands of the sea, Israelites had 3,000 men in their army. To make matters worse, they weren't even properly armed. We saw in chapter 13, verse 22, how the only ones who either had a sword or a spear was Jonathan and King Saul. 
So amongst the 3,000 people, Jonathan and King Saul were the only ones who had spears or swords. Everyone else, they came out with farming tools, with shovels, with pickaxes, with crowbars. Chariots, horsemen, swords, and spears versus pickaxes, shovels, sickles, and crowbars. However you look at this, there was no way that the Israelites were going to come out on top. This is why many started to hide. This is why some even ran home, not even trying to put up a fight, because they knew from the look of things, this was a battle already lost. From 3,000 men that initially formed the Israelite army with King Saul leading in charge, we see in verse 2 of today's passage that only 600 remain. Now, these 600 who remained were not courageous, were not better, but we see that they were trembling, shaking in fear, knowing that they are clearly outnumbered and outweaponed. Perhaps people are asking, King Saul, what's our plan? What are we going to do? Surely you must have a plan. You always have a plan. Now that you offered up the sacrifices unto God, is God going to come rescue us? Should we be expecting for the heavens to open up, for God to send his heavenly army of angels? Or is God going to bring about Exodus 2.0 by sending plague after plague towards the Philistines? King Saul, what's wrong? Don't just stand there. Do something. Please tell us something, anything. You've got to do something. You're the king. Sadly, Saul had no answers. Saul really had no idea what to do. He had no idea what to say. Well, that's, that's not totally true. In fact, Saul had been informed all along with the Israelites multiple times regarding what they should be doing, regarding what they should have done, which is getting on their knees and crying out to God for help. They should have been pleading with God for mercy and for his rescue. Because time after time, even as Prophet Samuel addressed the Israelites during his farewell speech, the one thing... He literally had one job, right? The one thing, the one thing that he pleaded, that he begged the Israelites was for them to always fear the Lord, for them to always serve the Lord, for them to always obey God's voice rather than rebel against the commandment of the Lord. We see in chapter 12, verse 14 and 15, if both you and your king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, things are going to be great. But... If you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be not for you, but against you and your king. What a tragedy King Saul had forgotten. To make matters worse, it appears as though no one else remembered. Samuel said this not only to Saul, but the entire nation of Israel, but it appears as though not a single person, not one person in Israel remembered If only someone, anyone, had come up to King Saul and reminded him of the great command, it appears as though they were not in a place to reflect. They were not in a place to remember. They were not in a place to think about perhaps the only remedy, the only greatest source of comfort and security in the midst of their chaos. The solution wasn't a greater or stronger army. The solution wasn't a better weapon, no. The solution is utter dependence on God. But instead, they were too busy trembling, too busy running, too busy hiding, too busy shaking in terror, panic, anxiousness to think about God or anything else. So while people are shaking, while people are trembling in fear, while King Saul was paralyzed and made no efforts in finding out the will of God for this battle, here comes Jonathan. Here comes Jonathan, the son of King Saul. And from the look of things, unlike everyone else, it seems like he has a plan. It seems like Jonathan had a plan. Look with me in verse 1. One day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let's go. Let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah in the pomegranate cave in Megron. The people who were with him were about 600 men. So what exactly was Jonathan's strategy or the plan of attack? What did he say in verse 1? Basically, Jonathan told his armor bearer, meaning someone who carries his armor because it was heavy back in the day, 
Basically, Jonathan told him that they should go over to the Philistine side for a surprise attack. Not with the entire army of, Na- uh, army of Israel, not with the most elite soldiers of Israel. Jonathan's strategy was just you and me, just the two of them. Is Jonathan out of his mind? Does he not realize who he's dealing with here? May I remind you again, there are, they are the Philistines. People who, is lining up, who are lining up with 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and, as, as, and soldiers as many as the sand in the sea. This is not, these are not just numbers. Two versus tens of thousands. And you want to do what? A secret attack with just the two? I would assume that this would be the normal response for anyone who has common sense. But even Jonathan's armor bearer appears to be not thinking straight, right? Look with me in verse 7. What does he say? Basically, he responds to Jonathan saying, Whatever you say, Captain, I will follow you. My heart and my soul is with you all the way. Jonathan's plan or strategy had suicide mission written all over. Jonathan, what are you thinking? Do you not realize the situation that we are currently in? All of Israel is trembling, hiding because of the lack of power, because of the lack of experience, because of the lack of weapons, and you want to do what? Friends, none of this makes sense until we read verse 6. None of this makes sense until we read what Jonathan says in verse 6. And this is what he says. He says, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised, or go to the land of the Philistines. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. Let me, see, let me read that one more time. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. Unlike, the, unlike King Saul and the rest of Israel, Jonathan remembered. Jonathan remembered the command and the promise from God. Jonathan believed that the battle belonged to God. Jonathan believed that God indeed had the final authority regarding who he will grant victory. For Jonathan, he believed that the battle was not determined by the stronger or larger army. Jonathan believed that the battle was not determined by who had the better weapons. No, Jonathan believed with all of his heart that the battle was determined by God alone. He believed that God was in control. He believed that God was in complete control. To everyone else, Jonathan was being reckless. He was being foolish. He was being out of his mind. But when we read the situation in light of what Jonathan shared in verse 6, we begin to see his actions not as foolish, not as reckless, but as courageous as faithful. Friends, I believe God desires for us to see this great and clear contrast between King Saul and Jonathan. While King Saul was busy calculating, thinking if his army is strong enough, thinking if his army is big enough to face the Philistines, while what conquered Jonathan's heart, what has gotten in Jonathan's heart was not regarding the size or the strength of the army, but regarding the size and the strength of the mighty God himself. Will God grant us victory over the Philistines? Is it God's will for Israel to be victorious against the Philistines? Or does he desire for Israel to be conquered by the Philistines? Whatever God desires, I submit, I obey. Although Jonathan desired for God to grant them victory, unlike King Saul, Jonathan was open. He was ready to submit and obey God's will regardless of his desires, regardless of his agendas, regardless of his goals. For Jonathan, he believed with all his heart that if God is willing, and if, God is in the, if it is indeed God's will, nothing, nothing is going to stop Israel from being victorious against the Philistines. No amount of chariots, no amount of horsemen. You can even break nukes. They didn't have them back then, but for Jonathan, he was so confident not in his own abilities, but in in the abilities of God himself. And this is why Jonathan shared this surprise plan of attack to his armor bearer. However, what's fascinating about verse 6 is how Jonathan shares 
it may be that the Lord will work for us. Meaning, God doesn't owe us anything. He doesn't have to do anything according to our desires, according to our appeals, according to our requests. Even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't grant us victory against the Philistines, that's okay because God is indeed sovereign in perfect control. And he will do as he pleases according to what he thinks is best. Unlike Saul, Jonathan had complete faith in God. Unlike Saul, Jonathan's confidence in God was unconditional. It did not waver when circumstances got difficult. It never was dependent upon situations. Instead, it was constant, steadfast, rock solid, unwavering, regardless of the circumstances or situations. Friends, when we boil it down, boil it down I believe there are only two types of obedience towards God. I want to ask of you guys to think about what kind of obedience you have towards God. There's only two types of obedience. There's only if obedience, and there's even if obedience. Only if obedience, and even if obedience. Only if. I will obey only if God grants me what I want. I will be more devoted to God and more devoted to God's church only if he takes away the specific thorns in my life. I will trust God only if you answer my prayer request in the way that I want. I will love my neighbors only if they first love me. Friends, I'm sorry, but God's not interested in this type of transactional, half-hearted obedience. In essence, we want to bargain with God, our devotion for his blessing. But at the core, that's not obedience. That's not submission. That's not being loyal or giving reverence to God. Instead, the type of obedience that we see in Jonathan is this even if obedience. This wholehearted, single minded, complete obedience. Even if I don't get what I want, I will obey you until the end. Even if things are out of control, I will still obey, for I trust that you are always in control. This past week, our youth group had this joint youth retreat with a few other churches in the Connecticut area, and we focused on the book of Daniel, uh, focusing on the theme of courage or being courageous. And throughout the book of Daniel, we see time and time again how Daniel, as well as his friends, were put in very difficult circumstances and situations and where their faith was tested severely in Babylon. Yet each and every time, we see that they had this even if obedience, even if mindset. For example, when Daniel and his three friends were thrown into the fire or threatened to be thrown into the furnace unless they bowed down to King Nebuchadnezzar and his, uh, and his statue, this is how they respond in Daniel chapter 3, 18. They respond by saying that God will save us. God will save us. You can throw us into the furnace because God will save us. But here's the kicker. He says, but even if he doesn't, but even if he doesn't, we will still not worship your God. We will still not compromise. We will still not bow down to the gold statue that you have set up. Why? Because their obedience and their allegiance to God was not based on life circumstances, was not based on their agendas and their desires, was not based on what they desired, what they want. But it was unconditional, based on the character of God's faithfulness towards his people. Friends, this is the type of obedience that Jonathan had as he and his armor bearer went into the land of Philistine. They weren't trying to hide or sneak into the base of the Philistines. What did they do? We see in today's passage in verse 8 and 10. They went out in the open. They just went out in the open, and that was his strategy. Look with me in verse 8 to 10. Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over uh, to, the, to the men, and we will show ourselves to them. And if they say to us, Wait, then we'll wait. But if they tell, tell, tell us to come up, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into our hand, and this shall be the sign to us. Friends, Jonathan purposely wanted to catch the eye of the Philistine 
because that's uh, and to see how they respond. If they tell Jonathan to wait, that means that God did not grant victory against the Philistines. But if they tell Jonathan, his armor bearer, to come up, then that signifies that God has granted victory over the Philistines. Perhaps it's because Jonathan only had one other man with him. We see in verse 12. What do you see in verse 12? That they finally came across to the Philistine guard, and they didn't see Jonathan as much of a threat. Can you imagine? You had an entire army behind you. You have these two tiny guys coming up to you. Oh, yeah, come up. I mean, what harm are they going to do, right? So they invited Jonathan and his armor bearer up into the Philistine camp. And the rest was history, friends. As God began to do his mighty work, miraculous work in a spectacular fashion. Look with me in verses 13 and 15. Verse 13 and 15. 13 to 15. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hand and feet, and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer killed them after him. And that first strike, that first strike which Jonathan and his armor bearer made, does not specify what weapon they used. They killed about 20 men within it, within, as it were, half a furrow's length, an acre of land. And there was a panic in the camp, in the field, among all the people. The garrison and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked, and it became a very great panic. Friends, if you thought those Marvel or DC superhero movies were not realistic, check out this story. Because look, it doesn't make sense how this is even possible, right? We see that Jonathan and his armor bearer, just two men, climbed up into the Philistine camp. And may I remind you, only one of them, only one of them had a proper or legitimate weapon with the other one probably holding some farming tool. Yet as the fight breaks out, it was clear as day whose side God was on. I mean, friends, if you you think about it, if you were to bet, right, if you were to place a bet, 2 verses 20, who would you bet on? Maybe Jonathan and his armor bearer were very good in combat, but they were outnumbered by 10 times. It was 2 versus 20. And it wasn't like Jonathan and his armor bearer had like an OP weapon. It was just a sword or a spear and a farming tool. Their weapons were severely weaker than what the Philistines had. Yet we see in verse 14 that after that first strike, they defeated about 20 men. But friends, things get even crazier. As soon as Jonathan and his armor bearer not just survive, but destroy the 20 men of the Philistines, we see in verse 15 that there was a great panic in the camp. People began to panic, right? Yeah, you would panic if these two people defeated 20 people. But what else happened? We see that the earth began to quake. Friends, from a worldly perspective, Jonathan and his armor bearer should be the one trembling and panicking. But instead, what's happening? It was the Philistines who were shaking, trembling in fear. How and why? As we saw earlier in battle where Israelites were involved, it was God. When God shows up, people shake. When God shows up, people tremble. God was the one who caused the great panic among the Philistines. God was the one who caused even the earth to quake and tremble. And God was the one who caused great fear upon the Philistines. So Jonathan and his armor bearer defeats 20 men, camp breaks out in panic mode, earth begins to shake, people are freaking out, but friends, it gets even better. Well, better for the Israelites, not for the Philistines. Look at me in verse 20. What happens in verse 20? Basically, with all the panic, fear, and earthquake, the Philistines didn't know what was happening. They didn't know what hit them. So they started attacking each other. Friendly fire. Friendly fire. They started swinging their swords and anything and everything that was moving. And indeed, all the men of the Philistines were against themselves. And then we see in verse 21 that Hebrews, the former Israelites who had been living with the Philistines, perhaps these were the people that initially abandoned the Israelites. They're like, there's absolutely no hope in this place. They immigrated over to the Philistines and they lived with the Philistines. Perhaps some of them were even in battle, fighting against the Israelites. But what do we see in verse 21? They turned and they began to fight, not against the Israelites, but against the Philistines. Friends, it started off with just two, Jonathan and his armor bearer. But now they had Philistines attacking each other, former Israelites taking their side and fighting with them. And then we see in verse 22, those cowardly Israelites, 
who are too busy hiding and going home. They came back. They came back and joined Jonathan in battle. And long story short, the nation of Israel, but despite being shorthanded, despite being outweaponed, despite being weaker, despite being the weaker opponent, they came out on top. Why? How? I believe verse 23 spells it out for us. Look with me at verse 23. Verse 23 lays it out. The only reason why Israelites were, uh, were victorious against the Philistines. Why? Because the Lord saved the day. Because the Lord saved the day. Friends, it's only because the Lord in his sovereign and perfect will chose to save Israel. It was all the Lord's doing. It wasn't because King Saul's strong army. It wasn't because Israelites had superpowers. No, it was God. It was all God who allowed such victory to Israel, not because King Saul was faithful, but in spite of his unfaithfulness, because of his son, because of Jonathan, because of his courageous faith in God. Friends, this all started with one man, and Jonathan. In the eyes of the world, he was out of his mind. He was crazy. He was foolish. He was reckless. But to God, Jonathan was faithful. He was courageous. He was daring. He was obedient. Church, as we ring in this new year in 2023, I pray that we too will become the Jonathans of our generation. Because if we're to be honest, there's way too many Saul-like figures and not a lot of Jonathan-like figures, even in this church. Just as God had instructed the Israelites, he also instructed us to be obedient to his word, to serve him as our only master, to treat God and his living word as the final authority of our lives. Friends, can we make this prayer for this year, 2023, that we will become the Jonathans in our campuses, that we will become the Jonathans in our workplaces, that we will become the Jonathans in our families, to inspire other people around us with our faith, with our courage, with our devotion and our obedience. So often, even, in those, even, in those, uh, even those in the church, so often, even people who are churchgoers, who claim to be disciples of ch Christ, have been heavily influenced by the world that we're living in, by the culture that surrounds us. And sadly, for many of us, we don't even try putting up a fight. Many of us are like the Israelites, running home, not even wanting to fight, hiding, hoping that no one will find us. Sure, we come to church for fellowship, but it's been too long. Friends, it's been way too long since we've taken our greater identity and devotion as Christians seriously. Friends, can we pray for our church? Can we pray for our community to strive to be more like Jonathan than Saul in the year 2023? May we be a community that inspires each other and encourages each other, that influences each other to deepen our faith in God. So often Christians have grown way too comfortable discouraging each other, putting each other down, blaming each other for no good reason. Instead, can we pray can we pray that we will become a community of believers that inspire each other, that encourage each other as iron sharpens iron to grow deeper in our understanding and obedience to God's word. Quickly look at the person sitting next to you, sitting behind you, sitting in front of you, and ask yourself, is that person encouraging me and inspiring me to love God more? And, and the second question I would like to ask is ask yourselves that same question. Am I inspiring the person sitting next to me to grow deeper in their relationship with God? That, friends, is the call of the church. If we are not doing that, friends, it's probably better for the, for the kingdom of God for us not to exist. If the church is not doing its job for us to encourage each other to grow deeper in our walk with God, why are we here? Why do we exist? I'm sorry, it's a waste of time. True, unconditional obedience, friends, is what God desires. Not only when things go our way, not only when we get what we want, 
But even if things don't go our way, even if it requires sacrifice, even if it requires us to be a little bit uncomfortable, even if it requires of us our time, our money, our energy, our efforts, we will still obey. This is my prayer for each of us, that in year 2023, we will be a community. We will be a community that exalts God as our ultimate Lord and Master above all else, not only with our lips, but with our entire being with our speech, with our action, with our thoughts, with our desires, and with our goals.